Hi everyone, hope everyone is fine. I hope you can hear me well. First thing first, tell me in the chat if uh, you can hear me well and uh, if the sound is well adjusted. I'll be playing some uh, tunes tonight, um, so let's make sure my voice is well adjusted. And uh, welcome to this uh, Create Together Volume 3 Masterclass. I'll be your host for this first part of the evening because we have actually a second part following more about that later um, but yeah I'll be your host I'm uh, Clement full stack designer here at Bitbird um, I'm also I also happen to be a computer science um, but don't stress out we're not going to dive into any complex math tonight because we are going to actually have a fun time looking at audio visualizers and uh, how to complement your audio with some nice music reactive visuals. Alright, I can hear in the chat that uh, it looks fine. So we're going to start this. Um, so uh, first I would like to explain you a bit what is an audio visualizer because there are, this is like a pretty general term and uh, we could interpret it in many, many different ways. So um, let's go back in time a little bit first and um, we are going to watch what was one of the very first audio visualizers. I hope the scratch sound doesn't scare you too much anymore. <laughs> I know at first it was very loud. All right. So I hope you can hear, you can see my screen also quite nicely. Um, so yeah, we're going to go back in time a little bit um, in what concerns audio visualizers. And um, one of the first time we actually ever heard of music visualizers is um, in 1978 with what was called at the time the Atari Video Music. So we are going to have a little look at what that was. Hello there. I'm going to give you a demonstration of the Atari Video Music Box. So the Atari Music Video Music is this analogic so module. Very simple module, as you can see. There are, a, there are a few module, a few buttons, some knobs. So basically, you have gain for your music, color for the color control of your visualizers, and contour. And here you have some few other buttons to adjust some more stuff. Um, and we can have a quick look at the back. Also very very simple but very functional. You have here these uh, connectors that connect to the TV for the visual output and here the very simple audio input with the left and the right. And what it does is pretty cool. Let's have a look. Take the road less traveled. I will turn my life around. I will turn my face from west to east. So, as you can see, we have some uh, visual input here that is directly reacting to the music. And this is one of the first time that this was available, at least to public consumer. Also, a little disclaimer, I hope you do not have any uh, epilepsy because this one is actually pretty intense um, in terms of colors and uh, flashes. So, um, yeah, that's basically what it does. There is not a ton of variation. It's almost always those um, triangle-shaped things uh, reacting to the music. But it's uh, very interesting to look at this and uh, see actually how far we came. 
So yeah, we have some variation here. It's mainly controlled with the little knobs and buttons that you've seen on the big module. So yeah, that was for the Atari video module. Very interesting piece of stuff. Um, actually, we have something now that is called the Pixel Music 3000, which is an open source alternative to this that was developed in 2008, if I can recall correctly. Um, it works on the same principle. Basically, you input an audio input there. Here it's using like the good old iPod and you have the visual output here coming through a TV. Uh, this was developed because the Atari um, video visualizer was uh, disrupted. Uh, and uh, so yeah, this one also exists now and still available, I believe. All right, so this was for the very first visualizers. Um, now, I think it's interesting to actually um, see the different types of visualizers that exist. Um, basically, we have two big um, categories for the visualizers. We have the real-time visualizers and the pre-rendered. As you can see, this Atari uh, video music thing was already some uh, actual real-time visualizers. There was no render to do. You plugged it, you played the music, and you had the visualizers that was reacting to the music. But there is also the pre-render visualizers. Um, basically, most of the time they are pre-render for two main reasons. The first one is the uh, compute power that is necessary to make them, and sometimes it's too much to be live, so it needs to be pre-rendered uh, because it couldn't be um, live streams, it would be too laggy. Um, but also there is another reason that some people pre-render those visualizers. Um, it's because you have more control, because you can always tweak some parameters and fine-tune them after the fact, which is pretty harder to do when it's live. Um, and then inside those two big categories, we have also um, some other subcategories uh, for those visualizers, because those could be used for very different types of things. Um, we can have the live events, concerts, or DJ sets visualizers, which will mainly be some um, uh, not pre-rendered, like real-time visualizers, but this can differ. We can also have some pre-rendered visualizers used in two DJ sets. Uh, we can have a mix of both also. It's not uh, necessary, necessary one or the others. Um, this can be used also in some uh, lyrics videos, um, video uploads, YouTube videos, and also maybe Spotify Canvas, which is a new form of media that uses um, some visualizers. It's actually a bit weirder. It's a mix between artwork and music videos, but uh, more on that later. Um, so let's get back to um, the history of visualizers. So we've seen like the very first ones, um, but then hopefully with the new technologies and uh, computers, we have seen some other visualizer coming up. Um, so we had one that was called Kutunga, uh, first released in the very first PCs in uh, 1995. Um, it's really hard to download nowadays, so I only have some few screenshots for you. Actually, let's continue to play some tunes here. All right. Um, so this is like a screenshot of the Kutunga visualizers. So those were some 3D visuals, mainly running on either CPUs or some very basic GPUs on those computers. It was all generative and uh, based on some uh, visual uh, visualization algorithm. We have another screenshot here. It's all abstract and uh, generated by some algorithm, so different at every songs every time. 
hopefully there are still some of the software that are available um, for example we have this one called milk drop that was released as a plugin of winamp i don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, winamp uh, it was basically one of the very first mp3 player uh, on windows you could also like cd and grave stuff on it um, it was quite quickly replaced by windows own software but uh, at the time it was really popular so i actually managed to download it because some folks on the internet managed to make a windows 10 version which is really cool and so we have it here and uh, i'm going to show you one of those visualizers it's called milk drop uh, it's a real-time one um, also warning if any of you are any uh, epilepsy this one can be pretty intense too so this is the Winamp player very basic one but uh, if you press some uh, secret controls you can actually have access to some plugins and here we have the milk drop visualizers let's see if we can pump up the volume a little bit there we go I'm gonna full screen it for you So as you can see, it's generating some weird visuals. It's almost always based on some fractals. Um, if you're not familiar with this, fractals are actually like mathematics functions that uh, keeps repeating themselves to create some infinite patterns. So here we have a, an interesting one. It's uh, simulating some kind of 3D environment here with some uh, reflecting waters so this is generating almost by itself so how milk drop works is that it has some scenes like pre-made kind of setups which yeah here you just saw the transition into a new scenes it has like hundreds and hundreds of scenes i don't think i've seen them all already and um, then each scenes has some specific algorithm that will react to the music. Um, I do not know the specific of all those algorithm, but basically it will um, react to some specific frequencies of the music and make some stuff change and happen. It can be really trippy. This one is like an infinite tunnel, tunnel vision of lights. And it reacts pretty well with the music and uh, actually this software is really liked amongst the um, audio visualizers community because some say its power and creativeness hasn't still be matched yet in terms of real-time rendering also fun fact it's really light in terms of um, compute power i can bring my task manager here for you to see as you can see, my GPU is only like at 7%, and that's not even because of the mill drop, that's because of <laughs> actually OBS on which I'm streaming. So this is real light and uh, really impressive. All right, well, I think you got it. No need to watch at it longer, even though I have to admit it's pretty mesmerizing. All right, so that was for um, the Winamp uh, visualizers with uh, Milk Drop. So after that, Windows implemented their own Windows Media Center, which also had this built-in visualizer. I think most of you are actually familiar with this one because I think it was still there until Windows Vista. So this one was uh, actually pretty popular. 
All right. Um, so that was for the um, audio history, audio visualizers history. Um, we can now have some, see some examples of what I consider some good audio visualizers. Um, so I'd like to show you first um, an audio visualizer that is applied to some uh, lyrics video. So for this one, we are going to have a look at Ramin Silver One for Fade, featuring pop culture. <laughs> so I believe this one has been made by uh, my fellow designer Mikey at Beatbird. Shout out to Mikey. Um, so this visualizer um, is a mix between a lyrics video and a classic audio visualizer. So for now, you cannot really see anything actually react to music, but it will come soon. So we have an interesting effect here happening. So we have this warp on the image, which is different to the warp on the text, actually. And here you can see the music visualizer happening with those bass lines kicking. You can see that the background layer is actually reacting to the bass and uh, it's scaling up actually on uh, each bass line. So this one is a pretty simple effect in terms of music reaction. It's not super in your face, it's just like a scale up of the background. So. Um, we're going to, to learn to make that, but also go a little bit deeper in it. It works well here in the music video because you do not want something to be like too much uh, because you, it's still like a lyrics video at the end. So you want to be able to, to read what is happening here. And we have sick transition here and still the music reaction to the beat. Too bad for cutting it right now. Super great music from uh, Roman Silver. And uh, we're actually going to still listen to some Roman Silver here because the next one I want to show you is a show visualizer. So the first one that we just saw is pre rendered, the second one is also pre rendered, and uh, it's supposed to be running on the uh, LED screens in the back uh, of Roman Silver during his uh, shows and DJ sets. Um, these visuals have been made by Heinhammers, at least for the 3D part. So Heinhammers, if you're not familiar with, uh, uh, was actually a Drulu designer and uh, art director. And now he's also working for a lot of other artists, um, including Roman Silver. And um, so, yeah. Let's watch this. So as you can see, this is one of the rare non-audio reactive music visualizers. So um, those are loops of um, some of his logos that actually plays in the background of his video. And um, so you, you would ask me why I choose this one, because it's actually not audio reactive. Um, the reason is those visuals, uh, so they are all pre-rendered uh, and they could run on any music, basically. And uh, that's what makes it actually quite interesting, because during shows and live streams, you want to be able as a music artist to play any music you want. Uh, Sometimes you have to switch, uh, change some stuff, adapt to the vibe of the room. So you want to be able to be flexible, basically. And if you have some uh, fully pre-rendered visualizers, this could be um, this could come in the way. So what happens there is that you have those like pre-render visuals that will run anyway, and then on top of it you can add some actual real-time visualizers that could be 
either uh, happening on the luminosity of the, of the image, the full global scale, could be also some other factors, some other effects. There are a lot of them that can run uh, on an analogic machine. And so, yeah, I thought I thought that was interesting. And also, I have to say, they're really beautiful. I did a very, very good job at this. So, yeah, let's check some other ones. Um, all right, so we have another one here. Uh, it's the classic non-copyright sound visualizers. I guess most of you have, are also quite familiar with this one. Actually, big shout out to um, to the homies Dust of Apollon and Sunday for this release on uh, no, copyright, no copyright sounds. Hopefully we can use it because it doesn't have any copyrights. So here it's a pretty uh, simple visualizer in appearance because it's actually not that simple to make but it's simple in the concept. We have a background that is um, could be either a video or a plain background and we have this uh, music reactive orb here um, which seems to be 3D actually it's made in After Effects so it's like two and a half D. It's never really uh, 3D here. Um, but yeah, this one looks great. It reacts to the bass and um, also to the wolf frequency here. So all the little uh, variation here. So uh, looks great. I think it's the same. Um, it's the same visualizer ever. I, I, I do not believe they ever changed their visualizer, so it must be like over eight years, but still looks great. And uh, it's part of their identity now. All right, and now I'm gonna sh show you another style of visualizer that I really enjoy. It's the one from uh, Drulu. So at first you won't really see anything because it's uh, really subtle and um, that's one of the things that you really have to try to manage when you're doing some uh, audio visualizers because it can quickly become kind of tacky and uh, in your face and there he goes the zoom out and uh, the lights reacting to uh, the hi-hats, the bass and uh, for me, this one is uh, a really great example of uh, a good visualizer because you have some audio reactive stuff, but it's still visually quite simple and pretty appealing. So here we have the base that is uh, represented as the red color and uh, on the left in some kind of bluish color, we have the um, some other frequencies. Not exactly, not exactly sure what that is, but uh, some higher frequencies for sure. The bass is on the red. Um, looks really cool. And um, actually, a fun thing to do when you are actually doing your own visualizers for your own music is that you mostly have access to all of the stems and all of the layers. So a cool thing is that you can actually take all the layers independently and make them react to a bunch of stuff and be really free and uh, make some very specific things react to a very specific stem or track, which is uh, sometimes quite a challenge when uh, you're using a music that maybe isn't yours or you only have access as one MP3 file or wave, doesn't matter. Um, because there you have to analyze the music by yourself and try to find which frequencies uh, is um, which instruments uh, is made uh, by any frequencies um, which can be kind of tricky when there is a lot of them and that they're all stacked up um, but hopefully I will uh, show you a way to make it easier 
All right, so uh, again, great visualizer, I think made by Hein. Really great job here. And um, yeah, what was this? Yeah, this was for uh, the Spotify visualizer, but we're going to pass in this. Mostly because there is Thorwell speaking and I know he doesn't really like this interview. <laughs> so let's keep it. And uh, now we are actually going to start to really look into how those visualizers are made. And we're going to uh, take a look at the uh, actual files, actual decent files. Um, so for this whole masterclass, I will work with uh, two softwares, mainly with After Effects and also with Blender. I'll just take a few seconds to read the chat, see if there is any uh, questions there. Okay, we have some love that is being spread, that's nice. Imagine Clem looking at this visualize in, in his free time just to determine <laughs> if he has seen them all. Yeah, the meal drop visualizers are uh, really mesmerizing. I could watch them for a long time. <laughs> um, for a visualizer like this, would the whole video have to be rendered at once? Um, so NDRU, I'm not sure which one you were referring, but if we are talking about the two last ones that we watched, uh, yeah, they were made all at once. Um, the, the, yeah, the four last visualizer that we saw were pre-rendered, so mostly for sure rendered all at once. All right. Uh, so now let's dive into some breakdowns of some famous audio visualizers. First, we are going to start with the Trap Nation one, and I'm going to show you a little render that I made for this one. Big shout out to uh, Trap Nation and Andre. I couldn't just use the Trap Nation logo, of course, so here we have the Bird Nation. Brand new nation, who knows? We may see it happen. So here, what is happening? First, I hope you recognized the great tsunami playing here. Um, so yeah, what's happening here? So we have this big uh, logo here, spherical logo, uh, that is reacting to mostly the bass. So what happens here is that first it scales up. We also have this spectrum thing, fully colored, uh, that goes crazy around it. Almost every time at the drop, it goes fully crazy. And we also have those uh, millions of particles here uh, that kind of react to the bases too and that uh, increase their velocity because of the bass. So let's see how that is actually made and let's jump into After Effects. So um, this is a pretty uh, heavy project file. It for sure won't be playing in real time on my computer because there is a ton of different effects. As you can see, we have scales, we have particles, 
we have some um, audio spectrum, we also have some um, motion blur. So it goes pretty crazy and that's for sure one of those kind of visualizers that you cannot really run in real time because of all of these effects. So let's see. Um, let's go through um, how the project is organized. So we have a first composition here, which is this one, um, where we have basically the Bird Nation logo here. I'm gonna toggle it on and off so you can see. So we have the Bird Nation logo and we have the particles here. So actually we have two of them. Why um, two? Well, that's because two particles are better than one, I guess. <laughs> well, actually, it was if it was me, I would only have one layer, but uh, I tried to um, match the style, so I just went for two. And uh, we also have the background here. So let's go layer by layer how this is made. So first, the layer, actually it's not super interesting, we only have a mirror effect, uh, so we can have like, yeah, basically this mirror, it's kind of self-explanatory, if I turn it off, we can see like it's a normal photo, and if I turn it on, we have the mirror effect, that's because the, the Trap Nation uh, visualizer is playing a lot on uh, this kind of symmetrical effect that we also have on the particles. So let's watch the particles. And so yeah, the particles here, they're made using uh, the Trapcode Particular plugin. So Trapcode's plugins are made by Red Giant and um, they're not free, sadly. Um, even though some people would tell you they can be free. Uh, but they're not free. There are really great plugins though, really worth checking them out. Um, and they can let you do a lot of stuff. We have uh, the particular plugin, we have the sound keys plugin that we will uh, look into uh, in some time. And uh, we also have some a bunch of other ones that are really useful as a graphic designer. Um, but what the particular plugin do, basically, we're not going to dive in too deep into that. But basically, create some particles uh, in some kind of fake 3D environment. And you can input it some force in it uh, to the particle, some speed. You can tweak the particle aspect. For example, we can uh, have a quick look at here, this particle one. Um, we can change the size, for example, here we have a size of 2, but we could go with a size of 10, let's say. It should make some uh, big FT particles there. Let's go back with 2. It looks more, a little bit more subtle. Um, but yeah, what's really interesting here is um, how the particles actually react to the sound. Because as you can see, uh, in the preview video, every time there is like some loud bass, the particles will flow faster at your face. So, how is this achieved? First, we have to look at the Sound Keys plugin. So, the Sound Keys plugin is a very useful plugin that will analyze the audio for you and create some keyframes out of the audio. So. When you first apply the sound keys effect to a layer, most of the time it will be on a, on a plain background. It will look kind of like this. So basically you will, uh, you will have an audio spectrum here uh, of the song playing. And uh, what you want to do with the uh, sound keys is to um, isolate some range of the spectrum 
So as you can see here, those are the, my um, green rectangles here. I have two of them, range one and range two. And whenever the spectrum goes into the range, it will fill it up at a certain percentage. And this percentage will then be uh, reported as a keyframe put into number. So let's try to find a big drop. All right, so here we have kind of a big drop. And uh, as you can see here uh, in the range one, no, that's actually the range two, we have some uh, base going on. And uh, this will actually fill this range. And you can see it more clearly here on the right. It filled it up to something like 25%. So once you actually hit apply on the plugin, it will create all the keyframes uh, frame by frame and report this number uh, on your keyframe. So we can have a look at these. So um, here we have the output 2 for example and put it the graph viewer. So you can see here are all the uh, keyframes generated by uh, the plugin. So it's mostly flat at the beginning because we do not have any heavy bass. But here you can kind of visualize then the music. And, uh, the first drop, here the second drop, and uh, the other parts and the end. Um, and so by default, the um, SoundKeys plugin will generate you some uh, keyframes between one, uh, 0 and 100. So here it never really reaches 100 because it never fully fills the um, range. Uh, I think it tops between 70 and 75, which is all good. And uh, we have then all those keyframes. And once we have all those keyframes, those actual data from the song that we isolated different parts of, we can then apply them to basically anything. Um, that is anything that is keyframable in After Effects. But that's like a lot of stuff. Um, but in this specific case, what it is applied to in the particles, for example, is the physics time factor. So we can uh, roll this up. And you can see here in the physics time factor, uh, we have linked the sound keys output to this effect. So here it says 0.7 plus the sound keys effect divided by 30. So what this kind of obscure math means is that the physics times factor will never be less than 0.7 because that's the actual normal speed of the particles. Yeah, because physics time factor is like kind of the speed of the particles. You have many ways to control the particle speeds, but this is one of the way. And uh, so you can never go lower to 0 0.7, which is like the speed at which they go when there is no base. And then to this, you want to add some more when you have the base. So we just add the value of the sound keys particles that we just got. And here we divide them by 30 because, uh, as you can remember, they are on a scale on 0 to 100 and we do not want to add 100 to this uh, effect because 100 would make them go super crazy fast. So first we just divide it by 30 to make sure they never exceed um, too much high speed. But yeah, that's basically how it works. Um, so that's for the particles, uh, pretty simple. But then we also have um, the Bird Nation logo, which is maybe one of the most interesting parts. So let's dive into the Bird Nation logo comp. So it may look kind of complicated, but it's really not. So let's go step by step. And we will only we will only keep
keep the logo. So the logo is just this static circle, right? Doesn't move. Well, in the new uh, Nations videos, uh, those logos are actually animated. They have some little animation going on, but um, basically it's the same thing. Now it's just an, Im an image. Could be a video to a GIF, anything. The thing is, for now it stays still. Then to that, we'll add the first audio spectrum. So we have made some kind of modification to the spectrum because at first, when you add a spectrum to a layer, it doesn't look like this, right? It looks kind of more like this. Well, this one is still kind of modified because um, it's upside down, but you can kind of imagine it like it's in the, in the other way. Actually, I can make it in the other way right there. So this is what an audio spectrum looks like when you add the uh, very basic um, effect of After effect that is called audio spectrum. So I just moved it to the left because one of the goal is to mirror it uh, so we can uh, have it right there and we can then warp it to make it like a full circle. And also we have there therefore the uh, symmetry effect that we have all along the uh, Trap Nation visualizers. And uh, then once we have this, also I just made some little tweaks on the uh, audio spectrum so that we do not have the whole frequency but only like the interesting parts that are the bass until um, the end frequency which is 135 so it's between 20 hertz and 135 hertz I believe and uh, once we have all this we just use some uh, polar coordinates so we can actually warp it up oh and there you see I forgot to flip the side so it goes inward which is not the best and now it goes out outward great um, so that's for the very uh, base of it and you can see if we add a big logo back it already starts to look like the Trap Nation visualizer. So now the only thing that we have to do is to add all the other colors that go with it. So for that it's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is to take the audio spectrum that we have now, the white one, and we just have to duplicate it and uh, add uh, and uh, in the uh, audio spectrum um, specs you can all, you can uh, shift the um, well it's called audio shift and uh, you just have to modify this value a little bit so it will actually shift in time the way it reacts to the audio and therefore um, it will have some kind of uh, latency on it and it will show through uh, a little bit behind and uh, you can repeat that and also of course you, you gotta change the color to whatever you want actually and um, you can repeat this process um, for all the colors that you want so we have orange red pink blue cyan and green and all of them have some different values uh, in the audio shift and the uh, also in the audio duration so some of them last longer and some of them last um, a bit quicker and uh, there you there you go you have your uh, full color visualizer and this will react just as the trap nation one does uh, doing this uh, very funky ears there that is very uh, recognizable uh, great, and uh, now that we have all that, what um, sells it best actually is to put some uh, blur, motion blur to it. Um, 
because if we do not have any motion blur, I'll just show you. It doesn't look as interesting, I'll say. So here we are supposed to be in a very uh, big drop moment and uh, we do not have any blur. It doesn't seem to move too much. So yeah, to really make it better, we just add a little bit of uh, radial fast blur, which really makes it make it like it moves and uh, goes fast. We also have some uh, luminosity and contrast uh, happening on the background. It's uh, also directly linked to the uh, sound keys keyframes so that uh, the background luminosity changes to the bass. But uh, yeah, that's basically how the uh, Trap Nation, well, Bird Nation here visualizer is made. Um, so yeah, three, thing, three things, the big logo, the particles and the background. Each one of them have some uh, music reactive touch. The logo, it's the size and the wall spectrum. The particles, it's the speed of the particles. And the background, it's the luminosity. And uh, all of them put together and made this. And it looks pretty nice. All right, so now let's have a look to another one very famous visualizer. So I guess you recognized it. It's the monster dog visualizer. A classic, really. It's been there for 10 years and plus. Almost makes me nostalgic, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I think it's one of those uh, monster cat videos that brought me to Beatbird first. Mostly one of Drulu releases, Bon Voyage. So yeah, a good uh, sentimental connection to this visualizer. Really simple yet really effective. It kind of changed through the years at first. I don't know if you can remember, but uh, it was this uh, black background and some particles floating and the color would change depending on the genre of the music was DNB uh, trap or anything would have different colors green green red blue kind of like the uh, how the uh, no copyright sound works uh, with those color scheme but uh, recently they changed so it's only white but now they have some uh, some um, animated videos in the background which uh, looks really nice so uh, for this one I choose uh, the track With Us from uh, I Live Here and Holyuki. Shout out to them. Uh, part of the Gullion Finch 4 compilation on which I made the actual artwork. It was really fun to work on that. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's check how this one is made. I'll uh, open up the After Effects file. And we are going to see how this works. I'm not going to save anything. Oh, by the way, my uh, After Effects is in French because I'm coming from France. Um, but uh, I'll make my best to translate you all the different effects. They should be kind of pretty similarly named though. So no problem. Right, so 
This one is actually a bit more simple than the Trap Nation one because there isn't much that reacts to the music except the uh, actual audio spectrum. Um, there could be, it depends on the visualizer, but sometimes the uh, background video reacts to the music, sometimes not. For this one I choose to not make it react. Um, yeah, so we just have the uh, here the audio spectrum. So the way it's made is not that simple actually, because even though there is an audio spectrum uh, effect built in in After Effects, it doesn't look super nice if you want some to have some separated um, spikes, let's say, because they will look kind of round shaped. So for this one, actually, I still have to use um, the uh, Trap Code plugins, uh, which was actually not that simple to work with uh, because this was not optimized for this task. And uh, how it works, as you can see here, is that um, I have how many? Almost like 20 tracks here. Um, which represents all of them a pack of three spikes and uh, all of them are controlled by some separate sound keys effects because sound keys can manage at most three different um, three different um, frequencies bounds sorry so there are 63 spikes in the audio spectrum so we have like 63 divided by three uh, sound keys effects so that's quite a lot um, but i'm going to show you how to actually make this one work without sound keys and uh, you will see why we use this kind of uh, not so optimized way so Let's do it. I'm gonna hide all the other ones so we can work on a clean plate. So yeah, as you can see, there is a lot of uh, different separated layers there. All right, and I'm going to hide them again. Great. So we can add a new solid that we will make black and we will call audio spectrum there we go and uh, we are going to look for the audio spectrum effect it's always super laggy when you launch the uh, effect panel there are so much of them to load all right so let's check for the sp audio spectrum and let's just add it to the layer so what you will have first is this uh, pinky thing here that doesn't react to anything. So first you have to make sure that uh, the audio layer is the right one. So for me, it's the song. So there you can see it reacts already and uh, quite nicely. You can change the colors to make it uh, whatever you want in that case we're going to be to go with some white and um, we are going to reduce the range of the frequency we're going to go from 20 hertz to 135 actually not that low because there there it will look more like some sinusoidal waves that's not really what we want to go for so let's increase it a bit Maybe let's go with uh, 1500, that looks good. We're going to add 63 frequency bands, just like the Monster Cat one. And uh, let's make them a little bit thicker. Um, it's here. And uh, here you can kind of start to see why we didn't use this method to replicate the uh, Monster Dog effect because on this one first of all the end of the bands are rounded 
and also they kind of look blurry. Um, so the blur, we can att attenuate it. There we go. So it doesn't look that blurry, but it's still rounded and that's not sadly something we can change. What we can change though is the fact that this is perfectly symmetrical. Uh, we can say that we only want to have face A, for example, so that it looks kind of more like the one we are used to. And uh, if we go back to the main comp, we can see how it looks. It's not the exact look uh, because it's fully rounded, but that could work in your case because you will never want to actually replicate um, an already existing visualiz visualizer. So if you want to go with rounded, that is the way. All right, I think that's it for uh, the monster dog visualizer. There's nothing crazy much to talk about uh, for this one. Um, but yeah, that's how they are made. And uh, now we're going to have a look at something else. Uh, oh yeah, I made the very mistake of closing after effect when it was fully loaded, so it's gonna take some time to close. All right, never mind, it finally closed. So now we are actually going to to dive into something a little bit more interesting. Not saying that those two previous visualizers weren't interesting. Very sorry, weren't interesting, but. This one is kind of more. Um, so I'm going to take a really quick pause, but while I do it, I'm going to uh, launch the preview of, where of what we're going to do in a few minutes. So I'll let you with that.
and I'm back. All right, so what you just saw is the uh, very freshly made Bitbird Mini visualizer. So I made this one uh, just for this uh, masterclass event. Um, so we are going to actually replicate the uh, Bitbird radio effect, but in this very tiny format. So as you can see, it consists of two big parts. We have first the 3D object here, um, which is why we are going to go into Blender in a few minutes. And we also have the uh, screen part and all the other compositing parts, um, which are made in After Effects. So um, first, let's talk about the uh, actual design of the module. Um, so <laughs> actually, I'm going to be very honest with you. This module doesn't make a lot of sense. I just created it because I thought it looks nice and cool. Uh, doesn't have for now actually at least a lot of functionalities. Uh, doesn't, have in, doesn't even have any audio jack or anything. Um, but yeah, what happened is that I was looking for some more minimal shape and um, to do some uh, kind of yeah mini player, um, almost inspired by the stem player from Kenny West. Um, so what I started to do was drawing some kind of stuff here. I don't know if you will even see anything. The light is too bright. Well, basically, I started to sketch out um, some ideas. At first, it was fully a cube, but it was kind of too much tall. So I switched it a bit. So it looks like this. And uh, I wanted to have those um, very nice button that you can push. It locks in. And once you push it back, it goes out again. And um, I never say no to a little slider. so. We also have a little slider. Um, but yeah, enough of the talk. I'm going to show you how I made the actual 3D object. So let's go into Blender. Blender, for those who don't know, who don't know is a, a free and open source 3D software. Um, you can do a lot of stuff in it, 3D compositing, 3D modeling. Um, and a lot of other stuff. Um, so I have a plugin that says I have to log in back. I'll just do that very quickly. Uh, so we can have everything running smoothly. This is a plugin I use to have some uh, nice HDRs. Um, It's really cool. It's called Blender Kit. And uh, for those who are familiar with Blender, um, I think you may already know it because it's really popular. But if you don't, Blender Kit allows you directly from the Blender interface to uh, actually have access to a bunch of um, different stuff, whether that is models, materials, scenes, HDRs, and even brushes. Um, it's really nice. For example, here I can look for Studio HDRIs and uh, I can preview them here at the top bar very easily and uh, select them and it will directly import into my Blender scene. It's really useful. I use it all the time. And uh, for this one, I actually use this HDRI of a, a very nice studio with some uh, lights in the ceiling and some uh, nice white backdrop. All right, so here is the 3D object here. We can uh, move around a little bit. So as you can see, it's really, uh, really simple. It's like a primitive cube here that has been uh, rounded, at least corner rounded. And now um, we have some uh, space here for the screen, some holes there for the slider the buttons also has also have some holes 
that's really important. Uh, I figured to have a nice space between the actual buttons and the place they are put in the radio because um, first physically it makes some sense to have some space between and also visually it looks way nicer especially uh, when you mess around with the um, the material and you put some subsurface scattering it makes stuff looks really real and really nice so I'm going to show you a little bit um, what it looks like with the wireframe. So it's kind of messy because it's pretty high poly. Uh, actually, uh, usually I never made those as high poly because you can always uh, make things look nice and rounded with some uh, modifiers or with some uh, smooth shading. But for this one, I especially needed to make it very high poly uh, because of the type of texture I used. This is a problem actually that I, that I encountered and the only solution to fix it was to make it very high poly. Uh, usually I do not go with this because it makes the render heavier, but um, the object by itself isn't actually really uh, high poly in uh, the global terms. Uh, it's still pretty uh, pretty okay to render. Um, we have the nice buttons here. Uh, one thing I really tried to to do was to make it feel nice. So I made those concave shapes that you would really want to put your fingers on. Um, yeah, basically most of the work was to figure out how to make it as satisfying as possible. I describe it. Um, the slider too, I tried to make it like you would want to put your finger in it and slide it back and forth. Um, at first the screen wasn't rounded, it was uh, really sharp because uh, you'll see that the screen is actually a very important part when uh, modeling it because you have there after you have to put some actual visuals on it and uh, you have to mask stuff out and uh, if it's really uh, sharp then your life will be easier uh, but if it's rounded it looks better so i thought to myself that's okay i'll uh, spend some more time on uh, masking but if it looks nice that will be worth it so um, now we can talk a little bit about the um, materials that i used um, i don't know if you will see nicely on the screen maybe i'll screen it but um, I really wanted to make it look real and uh, have a nice texture on the main plastic module so um, I figured out this um, node combination to have some kind of grain on the plastic to make it feel um, not super soft because nothing in real life looks that soft and uh, so I, did, I added this grain, which is kind of subtle. If you zoom out, you cannot really see it. But on the render, you can totally see the difference between a completely sharp one and a grainy one. So that was really uh, important for me. And uh, on top of all that, um, I added some subsurface scattering. Uh, so what does subsurface scattering do? basically is that it doesn't make the object fully solid but half transparent in a way um, so for now you cannot really see it because um, we are in a basic render view but if I pull up um, this one you can kind of see it here on the holes um, it gets kind of darker in it and like almost like the lights can penetrate in the material a little bit just as it does with our skin when you put it in front of uh, light sources for example uh, works well with the uh, hairs actually you can see that lights actually shine through a little bit and um, most of the times almost on the skin always on the skin makes it look kind of reddish 
Um, so that's a very uh, important aspect uh, that made it look real um, really easily. Actually, subsurface scattering isn't um, is actually pretty new in those uh, 3D softwares. That really kind of that really was a revolution when it was first introduced for uh, movies and uh, VFX softwares, because uh, when you do not have subsurface scattering, it looks fakes really easily. So this helped a lot of uh, designers and VFX artists to um, make their stuff looks way better instantly. Um, we also have some subsurface scattering on the buttons. Uh, not as much though, but uh, if we zoom on it, we can see it a little bit. So yeah, basically it looks nice. The materials aren't really crazy. Um, honestly, I mostly used some principled BSDF, which is like the uh, basic material you get in Blender. I'll still show you how I made those little grainy things on the uh, radio. So I'll just go into my shading editor so you can see the graph. Um, so if you have never seen this, don't panic, it's actually really not a lot. Um, can we have the textures back? Thank you. Um, so what happens here is the, that we have the principal BSDF here where we can choose the basic stuff. So like the base color, the specularity, the roughness, uh, the metallic, all that. So I went for a pretty highly specular because I wanted to have like this plasticky look, uh, but with a pretty high roughness at 0 0.8 uh, because I wanted to be to look uh, kind of soft in a way. So I went for this kind of roughness, um, and uh, there. Then we have also like this subsurface scattering uh, spec here that is really important. I didn't went f uh, with a very high number here. You can see it's at 0 0.07, but it was really enough to make it look nice. If you go too much with it, it can try to, it, it can look quite weird. Uh, I didn't want it to make it look like it was human flesh, you know, <laughs> that would have been pretty creepy. So I kept it quite low, but still enough to make it look nice and real. And uh, this part here is the part where I created the little bumps uh, to make it look grainy. Um, we have uh, Sven saying that is a bit traumatized by the uh, geometry nodes. <laughs> so don't worry, uh, Sven, those aren't geometry nodes, just texture nodes. We won't really uh, dive into geometry nodes. I, I agree, they can be a little bit traumatizing at first because it basically is some math mainly. Um, so no geometry nodes, just texture nodes. So basically here to go quite fast on it. What happens is that we have those first nodes, texture coordinate and mapping that are just to make sure that uh, it will be display nice on the object. And there, what is interesting here is that we have the noise texture that will create some noise. So let me show you what it looks like when it's inputted on uh, the base color, for example. Let's see. Um, doesn't look like much. Yeah, that's because of the shader compilation. It can take some time. All right, so here you can see the noise in black and white. So this is what we are going to work with mainly. You can change the scale of it if you want the, the noise to be bigger or smaller. Uh, you can change the detail scale. Well, Mine is already pretty small, so I don't really need to mess with this. You can also play with the distortion, um, which can make some really nice effect, but here we want to be not distorted. And now once I have this, I put it in a color ramp. So actually this one doesn't make much uh, 
this could be useful if I want to clamp some stuff and have some uh, not only bumps and highs and lows but also some flat parts uh, actually I didn't went for that so my color ramp here is kind of useless and then the final node is called bump so you can get this black and white map and uh, put it in the normal here uh, and the bump will, transport, will transform it into normals so basically normals what are they uh, they let you actually uh, fake some um, um, how is it called some heights on the material uh, it doesn't touch to the geometry but it makes it look like uh, thanks to the shader compilation uh, and that's how we get those nice bumps here that looks like some grainy stuff here I did not want it to make them too small because um, with the render method I went with uh, I was kind of scared that if the bumps were too small they wouldn't actually display properly on my renders but the settings actually happen to be the perfect one and the uh, last thing on this model that I worked on was the uh, animation for the buttons and the sliders this was pretty simple so the, the only thing I had to be careful with was to make sure those were nicely looping um, because the thing is as you can see here my animation is only 250 frames long uh, as I'm rendering it at 25 frames per second that's only 10 seconds uh, but my Beatbird radios episodes could be one hour long so of course I, I wouldn't be rendering any 3d objects to be a 100 long animation um, because that would take my computer to render for months and months so I don't know what I do not want that um, so I play it smart I only render 10 seconds but I make it as a loop so I can then in after effect make it loop as any time I want so for the animation basically it's really simple we have the sliders that is moving back and forth and always coming back to the same position so basically frame 0 and frame 250 are the same so that makes it loop and we only have one button here that is animated it's the second one if we start on the left and um, the animation was kind of tricky because I really wanted to make it feel like someone was pushing it and then releasing it um, so I had to test the different um, animation styles we can very quickly go into my animation panel here to see how it looks so here we have the uh, animation graph there uh, you can see we have some momentum here to really make it feel like it goes a bit under and then it stops and locks and uh, we have the same well this is for the first part so it goes under whoop, and then it goes back and it locks quite quickly and then we have the release part where it's basically like the inverse and we first want to go a bit down and then get released quite quickly and stops in a very abrupt way so that's how I made the animation um, quite simple all right and uh, so once we have this we can just like start a render of the animation so my advice for you if you do any uh, animation rendering is except if you do not have any other choices but I guess you will this will rarely happen but if you do not have um, any constraints what I suggest you to do is to render your animation frame by frame so that is like PNG or JPEG sequences um, I would also suggest to go with PNG because JPEGs compresses the image a lot and if you have gradients and stuff it will not look really good and also if just like me you have some transparency go for PNG you will never be wrong to go for PNG and um, so why would you go for PNG sequences when you can actually export as mp4 or 
move files well the reason it's kind is uh, really simple is that if for any reason your blender render crashes or stops well if you were rendering a mp4 file let's say well you can basically say goodbye to your render because if it crashes in the middle of the render your file won't be finished it will be corrupt and you won't have access to your animation even if you just wanted to have the first part this won't be accessible whether if you're rendering on um, png or jpeg sequences well the thing is after each frame is rendered it is saved in your computer so if it crashes at let's say the 100th frame you will still have the first 100 frames saved um, in your computer and you will be able to restart the render at the 100th frame um, and pray it doesn't crash <laughs> so um, that's really helpful uh, saved me a lot of time I went through the hustle of uh, rendering mp4 files at first when I first learned Blender and uh, believe me having those crashes that makes your file unusable is really not a great feeling so go for uh, PNG sequences even though it doesn't look nice in your folders because you have those like renders folders with uh, all those files but it's really worse uh, just in case your uh, computer decides to crash so yeah this is what a render looks like as PNG sequences uh, just the images and you can scroll through frame by frame to kind of preview it um, and this is what we are going to work with in our after effect file so let's go in after effects I'm not going to save my blender file and let's launch it By the way, for the real main Bitbird Radio renders, I actually kind of contradict myself because I'm not rendering them as PNGs, but as MP4 files. And that is because I'm using a very obscure method to actually export five MP4 files at the same time. Um, because on the main Bitbird Radio, we have like five cameras and uh, what I'm doing is kind of <laughs> a hack, uh, you could call it. I'm using the stereosto stereoscopic renders. So basically that is just for doing some 3D ones, 3D renders uh, with the, um, you know, the blue and the red shift. So you can uh, kind of do some 3D with it. Uh, usually it's only with two cameras then, a little bit shifted on the left or on the right. But there is actually a way to put more than two cameras and I'm using five of them and um, rendering them all as MP4 because you sadly cannot render them as PNG sequences. Um, so yeah, but now for this one, it's much easier. So PNG sequences also I have some transparencies, so I wouldn't even be able to make it as MP4. So now that we are in our after effect file what are we looking at um, this is a bit more complex than the two other visualizers that we break down um, because we have some uh, incrustations uh, to do so this is the main comp mini beatbird radio comp uh, there isn't much layers uh, we have the radio layer here so if I remove it, we only have the background. I have, what is this? Uh, yeah, that's the gradient background. As you can see, if I remove it, it's completely transparent. Um, by the way, it's, it says uh, black here uh, because I just created a black solid and then I applied um, the gradient effect as a radi radial br uh, gradient. Uh, so we could have this nice white light coming uh, on the back of the radio because on the render I, I don't think if you I don't know if you've seen it but uh, I actually placed some lights um, 
some light bleed on the edges uh, to make it uh, separate more from the background. Always looks nice. So um, to make it coherent, I uh, added some uh, lights also on the background there. And I picked some uh, orange just to make it match nicely. I like the, the color scheme. And uh, then lastly, in our timeline, we have the uh, Task Black song. Um, so first, let's uh, dive into the comp called Radio. Um, so as you can see here in this comp, we have two things. We have, um, well, the radio itself here. Uh, it's pretty basic, just like the, uh, it's just the 250 PNG frames um, that you have to import as PNG sequences. So um, just to show you how to do this, you first have to um, import your stuff by right clicking here in the project part and uh, choose import files. And once you select your uh, render frames, there is something very important to tick. It's here, it would say uh, it's prompt PNG sequences. This is really important, you want to check this one. You only have to select the first frame, so that's why it's important also to put all your render frames in the same folder. And uh, once you press, you choose this one and uh, tick the PNG sequence parameter, then it will import all of them and uh, basically um, make like a video file out of it. Um, so someone in the chat is asking me if the radio screen is done in After Effects or Blender. So the screen is actually made in After Effects. It would be possible to make it in Blender because Blender has a lot, a lot, a lot of features. Uh, but I figured it was simpler for me to do it in After Effects and uh, I would have more control on it. So I went for After Effects. And uh, we are going to see this right now, actually. Um, just to quickly wrap it up on the, the Bitbird radio uh, PNG sequence. Uh, once you do it, uh, once you import it, it will only last 10 seconds, um, which is not really useful for our case because we want it to loop. So you have two different methods to do it. Either you import it as a 10 second clip and under the time properties, you can input an, an expression that says loop out. But uh, that's kind of complicated. The simplest way is, is to go into uh, interpret, interpret footage, main, and uh, this pop up windows, uh, you can select loop at the very um, end here. And so for this one, I say, I said you have to loop 40 times. You could put any number, uh, put a high number, so you're sure you never goes outside of the loop. Uh, so I have 40 times 10 seconds. That was uh, much more than enough because I'm only doing it on three minutes um, workspace. But uh, yeah, this is a cool stuff to loop your videos. Uh, just go into uh, interpret footage and uh, there you have it, pretty easy. All right, so now let's talk about the screen. So as you can see, the screen is really looking like some uh, LCD or LED screen. Um, this is a cool effect uh, that I learned through some uh, YouTube tutorials, which is basically how I learn everything nowadays. Um, so I'm gonna show you how to achieve these, and then we are going to talk about how to achieve the um, audio reactive 3D file that you see here. Uh, but first, let's dive into how to achieve the uh, screen look. So I go into my screen comp. So we have a first comp here that is just to warp it, to make it match um, the, uh, well, the actual object. I had to pre-comp it because of some weird um, effects that wouldn't uh, that would override my masks um, 
but that's not super important. Let's dive in the actual layer of the mask. So yeah, that's how it looks. That's the flat 2D layer. Um, so don't be overwhelmed here. Uh, there are a lot of layers for what's happening, but basically we would we could only use uh, three of them if we wanted. I uh, made it a little bit extra, but uh, it's really easy to do. So uh, I'll disable all the effects so you can see how it looks first. And I'm going also to disable those layers because these are really extra. We don't really need them for now. So this is what it looks like at first. Uh, this is basically a black and white video input that I have here. Uh, we can go into this comp to see what it looks like. This is like my animation comp. This is basically you can imagine it like as the video feed that would go into the screen. So that is all black and white stuff. This is also where we have the uh, first text animation. Um, we have the loading, then we have the text animation, and then the music reactive stuff, um, which is made of particles. So once we have this, uh, we can put it in the screen comp uh, composition. On this layer, so this is the same layer, there is no, not any effects on it. On this layer, we are going to put um, an effect called CC Ball Action. So what CC Ball Action will do is basically take your layer and uh, kind of pixelate it but instead of being pixels, those are some nice spheres. So let's activate it and boom, we have our little spheres here. Um, and it looks kind of some, it looks like some little LEDs. Um, so there would be some other ways to make it look more like some pixels. So some real uh, squares but uh, I really wanted to go for those uh, spheres look, uh, LED looks. Um, so that is the um, CC ball action uh, effect. Really simple, you have some few parameters here. I mostly used just the grid spacing and the ball size. Um, so you can see if I change the uh, spacing, for example, um, it makes thing looks more big uh, so you can kind of choose the resolution basically of your screen like this we can go to let's say one or zero and uh, it will looks very high res um, this looks really nice actually uh, but I wanted to go for a much low resolution so I went for three which is still kind of high res but uh, if you go for bigger resolution, you will run into some problems. For example, let's go with 6. So it still looks nice, but for example, if we go into the text parts, it becomes harder to read. Um, at, actually, at 6, it still looks nice, but if we go into like 10, then it becomes harder to read like the Beatbird Radio, for example. Mini still looks nice because it's so big anyway, but um, Beatbird Radio here really starts to be hard to read. So I usually stay under 10, and for this one I actually went for 3, so it's really nice to read. All right, so once we have this um, uh, LED effect, well, LED shape at least, um, the only thing left to do is to actually um, put some uh, color correction mostly to make it look like some uh, actual LEDs. So um, what will happen here is that I have an effect layer. Uh, so effect layers are really interesting because you can stack a lot of effects on them and everything that is beneath this effect layer 
will be affected uh, by all these effects. So really cool to um, make a bunch of stuff have the same effects without having to duplicate them a bunch of time. So I'll disable all of them and show you what they do one by one. I'm going to zoom in a bit so you can really see what happens. So first we have a noise effects. So it's pretty hard to see what it does because at this stage, um, I guess even on the stream, you won't really see what it looks like. But um, basically it would add some noise. And uh, if I bump it up, because we are, we are at 9% for now, but uh, if I push it to, I don't know, 55%, we'll see that we now have a lot of noise and it's actually gonna reveal some grids here that we couldn't see before because they were so uh, low in terms of luminosity but with the the noise effects it starts to appear and this is nice for one reason because on the those lcd screens even if the leds are not turned on you can actually kind of see them or at least the reflections that appears on them um, this is kind of extreme though so i'm gonna let it at nine percent uh, also i did not put some um, noise color just noise without color because if i put colors then you can see it starts to go really crazy and uh, that's not really the look i want to go for so let's keep it without color and quite subtle yet um, then what we have next is some uh, gaussian blur so as you can see it's not doing a lot but it helps to give it some kind of glow to it um, to make it not too sharp because if it's too sharp then it will looks kind of fake so yeah i have only the gaussian blur parameter put to two so it's really not a lot uh, next up we have some uh, glow actual glow so this one is really the most important effect as you can see this one will really make it look like some uh, glowing leds so actually as you can see i have two glow effects the first one uh, is really to make it look like all of them are lit up um, there is a little bit of spread uh, but not too much and i have another one that actually um, spreads it a lot more. Um, this one is a bit heavy, um, but it really sells the LED effects well. And you can see all those uh, turned off LEDs a little bit more. Um, so yeah, you could uh, always try to um, tweak some parameters to have some different effects. Um, it's not exact science, but this one worked really nice for me. Um, and once we have those two glowing effects, I still have some noise effects on top. Um, this is really me being picky, but uh, because as you can see, it doesn't really change a lot. But it, as the noise is animated, it makes it look like um the screen is also animated and uh, not fully static so noise is always had nice to add to make stuff looks like it's actually moving and not some steel images even though if it's not really noticeable on the steel frame like this um all right so that is for the led style um actually as you can see here, I still have like three different layers here um, that aren't even turned on. And if I turn them on, we'll maybe see a bit of a difference. Well, first, it's a little bit more brighter. But what it does basically is that I have this color shift here, um, which you could say uh, look kind of like some chromatic aberration. Uh, this adds 
a next level of uh, realism to it. It's not mandatory, it looks quite nice also without. And also, it renders faster without. So if you're not looking for the super most realistic stuff, you're not uh, obliged to do so. Uh, and for now, I'll leave them turned off so we have some uh, better render capacities. All right, so now that we have the LED look, we're going to have a look at the actual animation and the audio reactive stuff. So it all happens in the animation folder here. So at first we have the uh, loading here. This is just like a YouTube video that I downloaded. And uh, then we have the Beatbird Radio Mini animation going. This is just like some basic animations going on. We have uh, this effect, which is quite nice. It makes it look like it's disappearing in a pixelated way. Um, what's the name of the effect? I can't even remember. Um, yeah, it's in French anyway, and I don't, don't know the exact translation, but uh, it's a nice effect. Uh, but that's not the real interesting stuff. The real interesting stuff is this 3D object here that is reacting to the beat. Um, so I could go uh, with many different ways to make the visualizer for this. Um, we could go for like a simple audio spectrum like the one Monster Cat uses. It would look kind of nice also on the on the screen. Actually, to be fair, kind of almost everything that is put in under the screen looks nice. <laughs> That's uh, almost magical. Um, fun stuff, you could actually input some uh, actual real videos under it, like we did for the Beatwood Radio 100th special episode. Uh, I put some uh, show uh, videos, some music videos. Uh, we had like the San Holo Lift Me from the Ground video. Uh, it looks great as long as the video input is put in black and white and uh, really highly contrasted. Uh, but for this one, uh, yeah, I wanted to have something a little bit more special and uh, I really like the 3D aspect of it. Um, so for this one I used another plugin from uh, Trapcode. It's called Trapcode Form. Um, again, you could do without it, you could do some uh, other music reactive stuff without. Um, for example, the uh, spectrum visualizer could be achieved uh, without any third party plugin and would work real nicely. Um, but this form plugin is uh, really handy. Basically, what it lets you do is um, to have some uh, particle objects. Um, so at first, um, you will not have like an object like this. It will be a plane or a cube or a sphere. But uh, there is a very cool feature that lets you input some actual 3D objects and render them as uh, some kind of cloud particles. Um, they have like a nice library already of stuff existing. Uh, I think I chose mine from here. Might be this one. And uh, the cool stuff is you can also input your own 3D object. So as you can see here, those are some 3D objects I used for the previous Beatbird radios. Uh, we have the dot logo here, BH, Tsunami, uh, Martios, Ribbon, Hondas. We have the 3D Beatbird here, of the Huke logo. So that's what I used. Uh, once we have those, it basically um, takes the mesh and make it uh, render it as little particles and um, they have a nice feature a uh, nice parameter that is called um, the disperse and twist so what this does is that it will take all the particles and individually spreads them apart and uh, that's on this parameter that my uh, music reactive keyframes will uh, react on um, so if we can find some kind of drop 
in the music for example right there we have the particles that are really dispersed a lot and uh, if we check my sound keys keyframes because as always I use the sound keys to isolate some parts um, of the audio spectrum if we have a look at it uh, not this one actually this one exactly you will see that we are actually on a spike here which is why all the particles are spread out that's because I linked it to my disperse parameter um, but that's not the only thing that is music reactive uh, on this there is also the rotation uh, that is uh, audio reactive so um, it fully rotates all the time but when we have some hi-hats coming it does like an extra spin and um, how this is achieved is first by um, analyzing um, the audio so I can pull up my sound keys here and um, you can see I have three different ranges here um, basically here I have the bass here I have the vocals and here I have the uh, hi-hats or I don't know if it's the hi-hats exactly um, but some very uh, specific drum here that we can hear um, that I could very nicely isolate uh, which gives me an actual uh, nice music reactive um, thing so once I isolated all those keyframes it's just of ma a matter of linking them to the right properties and make sure they are not like overpowered because you have to choose um, the nice ranges in the output um, as I said, sound keys by default will uh, output your um, parameters from 0 to 100. Um, you can actually customize them, for example, from 0 to 360. If you want to link them to some uh, uh, rotation parameters, that is very handy. Um, but you can also make them go from 0 to 1 or anything. You can even go into the negatives. Um, to make it match the properties you're trying to animate so that's really cool and uh, that's how i made the spinning effects also um, so yeah that's kind of it uh, for the most part uh, i see we are uh, almost at 10 pm and um, so i'm gonna end it here for the visualizer breakdown um, I'll take some questions briefly if you have any in the chat and uh, then we'll uh, end out the stream to Leonardo Scarenson um, which will talk about um, how to make your live stream uh, more interactive which is going to be a very nice masterclass I hope you stick to this Beatbird channel to see what Leonardo has to teach us um, so I'm looking at this chat right now trying to see if you guys have any questions fully owner saying I'm 100% gonna start using CC ball action in the future as you should that's a great great plugin Emric thanking us for the masterclass you're welcome Enric that was really fun to do and uh, I hope you really enjoy this masterclass and uh, most mostly I hope you learned something from uh, those uh, music and audio visualizers and um, that you will uh, maybe implement for your create together submission um, oh actually we have a question for uh, from Flyoner, and this will be our uh, last question before I hand out the stream to Leonardo. Um, what's your favorite built-in After Effects plugin? Uh, that's kind of a hard question because there are a lot of them. But actually, once I discovered this CC Ball plugin, I was kind of in love 
uh, with it, to be honest. It's a really cool plugin, um, really fun to play with. So I'll say the CC Ball Action plugin. Uh, and yes, don't worry, the VOD will be up either on Twitch or on the YouTube Bitbird channel. All right, uh, let's wrap it up. I hope you really enjoyed this masterclass and you learned a lot. And uh, I wish you all good luck for um, your Create Together submissions. And um, stay creative, folks. Bye. <laughs>